after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to view the tomb. There was a violent earthquake because an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and approached the tomb. He rolled back the stone and was sitting on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothing was as white as snow. The guards were so shaken by fear of him that they became like dead men. The angel told the women, Don't be afraid, because I know you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He's not here, for he has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. And the Jew is still loose today. They thought they had him. The devil had him dead and buried. But hallelujah. He fooled them. He came up out of the grave. And he, and he just didn't come up out of the grave. I mean, that's amazing. But he called it before it happened as the angel confirmed. I, I enjoy uh, telling Andrew baseball stories. And Juan. Juan is, Juan is, uh, he is a super fan in baseball. And one of, my, one of my stories that I went, when I was a senior in high school, there were three classmates of mine, three brothers, whose grandfather was Earl Combs. Now, unless you're a really super baseball fan, you have no idea what I'm talking about. But 1927 New York Yankees were named the greatest team in the first hundred years of baseball, or somewhere thereabouts. And the famous nickname for the first four batters of the Yankees was the Murderer's Row. And the lineup was this, Combs, Lazeri, Ruth, and Gehrig. And my classmate's grandfather was Earl Combs, a leadoff hitter for the New York Yankees, who's in the Hall of Fame today. And when I was a kid growing up, I, I even worked in his tobacco patch to make extra money. He was a farmer, and uh, we used to enjoy talking to the boys and find out you know, what, stories about your granddad playing with Babe Ruth and all that kind of stuff. And one, one of the stories was there was, in the World Series once against the Chicago Cubs, there was the famous incident where Babe Ruth hit his called shot home run. If you've never heard of it, he was mad because the Cubs fans in Chicago had treated his wife horribly that day in the stadium. They were doing awful things to her. He was mad. So he got up to bat, and he stepped out of the batter's box, and he took his bat, and he pointed it to the center field fence like this. And then he stepped back in the batter's box, and the next pitch went over the center field fence. Obviously, that got everybody's attention. And I remember we asked, you know, the guy, hey, what'd your granddad say about Babe Ruth's call shot? Because he, he was in the dugout watching this all along with the rest of them. He said, ah, he said, they just were sitting there going, what's he doing now? <laughs> he was always doing crazy stuff. What's he up to now? But Jesus did something much more impressive as a call shot. He called his own resurrection. Now, understand that this is remarkable, and I think that for those of us that have been exposed to the message of Jesus for any length of time, and this being 
the foundation of our faith. The Bible says if Christ is not raised, then, then our faith is in vain, right? But so those of us that are familiar, we're almost so familiar, we treat it almost as cliche. But think about it. How many of us have ever been to a funeral and three days later have run into the corpse walking down the street? I don't think that's happened to many of us, right? And if it did, we would what? We would remember, right? We wouldn't forget that one. But folks, that's precisely what the Bible said happened with Jesus of Nazareth. He was very, very publicly murdered and confirmed dead and buried. And three days later, he came out of the grave and appeared in, a res in that body resurrected to his disciples. And one can understand why that would, just as it would be today, unbelievable, it was unbelievable then. And, and that's the reason that the Bible, when the apostles wrote the books of the Bible, they went to great lengths to confirm the reliability of the report of his resurrection. And in fact, Matthew acknowledges how hard it was to believe because in Matthew 28, when Matthew describes one of the appearances of Jesus because he appeared off and on over a period of 40 days after the resurrection to various of his disciples at various times, and Matthew actually records that all these people saw him, but some doubted, even those that saw him because it's just not normal to see somebody dead and then a few days later walk around alive. That's the reason that we have the account in John chapter 20 of the apostle who, ain't, who, who um, earned the dubious nickname of Doubting Thomas. Because the account is that the day of his resurrection, that evening, Jesus appeared to his apostles behind closed locked doors. And that's completely understandable because the, because the same government that had murdered Jesus was potentially not happy with them and they didn't know what would happen to them so they were behind locked doors but Jesus appeared behind the locked doors and showed himself to be alive the apostles who saw him were excited Thomas wasn't there they reported the same to him and lo and behold Thomas defiantly says I'm not going to believe unless I touch the scars a week later, they're together again, and Thomas shows up, or Jesus shows up again, and, and says to Thomas, okay, I'm here, make good on your promise. And Thomas, certainly ashamed, and certainly convinced that Jesus was alive, worshiping him as his Lord and his God. But my, my point is that that account is confirmed how difficult it was even for his apostles who had lived with him and had heard him promise this and they were presented with evidence from their friends that had shared life together with Jesus. It was even hard for them to believe. So the Bible went to great lengths to confirm the resurrection of Jesus. I think another example of the doubts that his followers had, even in the face of Jesus' promises and how abnormal this was for somebody to rise from the dead, 
is probably one of the funniest passages in the whole Bible. And that's in Luke 24 on the road to Emmaus. When, Jesus, when uh, the, uh, uh, some of the disciples are walking several miles to the village of Emmaus outside of Jerusalem, and they're, of course, confused and dismayed because of all the events that have gone on that day and the tomb is empty and people are saying different things and they're going, what is going on? So Jesus starts to walk with them. And, and I love this opening line when Jesus walks up with them, he says, hey, so what are you guys talking about? And, and I love Jesus, you know, their response. Are you the only guy in Jerusalem that doesn't know what's going on? <laughs> now, if Jesus didn't laugh at that, then, then I'm absolutely amazed that he wouldn't laugh at that. Because that's hilarious, Right? I mean, he's the only one who knew what was going on. And so all that's to say that he walks the several miles. They had a long discussion on the road to Emmaus. He walks several miles with them. And finally, as they sit down to have a meal and break bread together, he reveals himself. And they are so transformed and they're so excited that they cannot keep it to themselves and even after a long day and a long walk of several miles, they hot-foot it back to Jerusalem to say, it's real. He is alive. You see, when we encounter Jesus, when we truly encounter Jesus, it's a transforming experience. You know, easy believism is not in the Bible anywhere. But a true radical surrender to Christ which is what the Bible calls saving faith, never leaves us the same. It's a changed life. Priorities change. Everything about life is transformed. When we truly encounter Jesus, just like those guys on the road to Emmaus. But the fact that it was so unbelievable is the apostles, when they wrote the books of the New Testament and the accounts of Jesus' life, and the letters to the churches, they made sure they were providing eyewitness evidence of the resurrection. They made sure they were providing undeniable proof of the reality of Jesus, his resurrection. When Paul wrote to Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it's recorded that Paul says, I delivered to you, I shared with you that which was of first importance that Christ died according to the Scriptures, that He was buried and that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. And then He goes on to say, and that He appeared to Cephas, which is another name for Peter. He appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then He appeared to over 500 brothers and sisters at one time. Most of them are still alive but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, as to one born at the wrong time, he also appeared to me. Notice how the emphasis, notice how the emphasis of Paul is on the multiple appearances of Jesus after the resurrection that all these different people saw, as many as 500 at one time. I've got a, another childhood friend of mine who's a, a circuit judge, and it's a, a criminal court that he presides over. And I, I sent him a text one time, and I asked him a question. I said, let me ask you a question. I said, how would you handle it if you were trying a case and the attorneys came in and were talking about what case they were going to present and whatever, and, the, and one of the uh, attorneys came in and said, Listen, Judge, I have 500 eyewitnesses for the case that I'm making in this trial. I have 500 eyewitnesses. I said, so what would you tell them? And he said, well, kind of complicated, but to make it as simple as I can, I would simply say, or more than say to do, he said, what I would do is I would allow them to present their witnesses 
And as soon as whatever witnesses they presented had clearly made the point of what they're trying to present to the court, I would cut it off. I wouldn't say you have this number or that number. He said, I would just let them testify, and when I, when I was convinced that the testimony had been adequate, I'd cut them off. The point being that 500 eyewitnesses is kind of a hard thing to overcome in terms of confirmation of something being real. And that's, that's exactly why Paul refers to it. And many of you have heard me share the story before, but it bears repeating that there was a, a friend of ours, a couple that were friends of, of Pam and mine, and the, and the fellow wasn't a, a believer. And we were in their den one night just visiting many years ago. Very highly educated individual. Um, and, uh, and we were talking about Jesus and his resurrection. And, and I made the point that he had been seen in a resurrected body by over 500 people. And this friend of mine, when I said that, he like, what? You mean there was actually reported to be somebody to have seen him after he raised from the dead? I said, yeah, man, try 500. And he was amazed at that. And, and, and to show you what the curriculum's like, it's some of the, he, he was a graduate of Harvard Medical School and had never read one word of the Bible. So that gives you an idea. But my point is that he understood instinctively the power of that eyewitness record. I mean, his response was based on he knew the power of eyewitness testimony, which is exactly what the apostles were confirming when they wrote in the New Testament about the resurrection of Jesus. Furthermore, you go on to 1 John chapter 1. Look at how John begins his letter. He says, What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, and what we have observed and have touched with our hands. That's three of the five senses. Hearing, seeing, and touch. All three of those, three of the five senses that the Apostle, uh, or Apostle John refers to as confirmation of Jesus and all that they knew about him. So this isn't some fairy tale, some pie-in-the-sky in the story that has that we're just supposed to sentimentally believe because it's a nice thing to believe in. No, this is hard evidence of real facts that are being presented. John goes on, concerning the word of life, that life was revealed and we have seen it and testify and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. What we have seen and heard, we also declare to you so that... What we have seen and heard, we also declare to you so that you may also have fellowship with us and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And then in Acts chapter 1, Luke, who the physician Luke who wrote the book of Luke, which is the account of Jesus' earthly life and ministry... When he begins the book of Acts, which is the account of the early church, in verse 3, just a couple sentences into the book, he says, regarding Jesus, he says, After he had suffered, he also presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days, and speaking about the kingdom of God. So what I'm getting at is notice how there's consistently with the apostles when they write about Jesus and they write about his life and they write about the resurrection, they're overwhelmingly concerned consistently, repeatedly, and not just one of them but all of them about reinforcing the fact that the account of Jesus and his resurrection in particular is not just some fairy tale. 
It's a real historical event that's documented by a multitude of eyewitnesses. So the point is that when one believes in Jesus, it's not a blind faith, but it's confidence in a documentable eyewitness account of the reality of Jesus of Nazareth who lived and walked this earth and rose again from the dead and there were multiple eyewitness accounts. And it bears repeating, and again, we've talked about before, but it bears repeating that so many times in the culture we live in that the truths of the Bible particularly the miraculous truths of the Bible, and I'd say you'd put the resurrection right up there toward the top of the list when it comes to miracles. How about you? Okay? And the miraculous truths of the Bible are questioned because they don't bear the weight of the modern uh, knowledge of science and how all that works. Well, the simple truth is you can't prove you got out of bed this morning scientifically. You cannot prove that Abraham Lincoln was president of the United States scientifically or George Washington or anybody else. Why? Because in order for something to be scientifically proven, it has to be repeatable and observable in a controlled environment, and it has to move from hypothesis to theory to law as a result of that. And there's a dramatic difference between scientific proof of something and historical proof. Scientific proof is that which is dependent upon the ability to recreate the issue and observe it and examine it. It's like I'm always amused at the, th- that the theory of evolution. Notice it's not the law of evolution. But, but it's, it's treated as if it's a law, right? I mean, it's spoken of as a fact, but it's just a theory because nobody's ever observed it and and seen it repeated in a controlled environment. And they're not going to. But that being said, that, that being said is that historically, through eyewitness accounts, through documentation, we can prove something that's an historical event that's happened in the past and prove it with confidence. And, and prove it with, with absolute confidence. The amazing thing is there are people throughout in our even modern day in the church. Uh, I'm thinking of Josh McDowell particularly, who was probably one of the best knowns, uh, the best known to do this, who by their own account, they set out to disprove the reliability of the Bible as a source of truth and the reality of Jesus' resurrection. In other words, they set out to disprove by historical evidence that Jesus never rose from the dead and this whole thing is just a a figment of somebody's imagination. Well, guess what? Josh McDowell did an honest exploration of that and inquiry based on all the available data he could find based on ancient historical evidence And guess what he came out to be? One of the most devoted followers of Jesus of a generation. Because he discovered that he couldn't disprove it. It was the most provable thing in the world. Based on the evidence available. And that's exactly what the apostles are confirming. So what I'm saying is that we have to understand that we're not, when we trust Jesus and surrender our life to him, We're not just wishfully thinking and believing in something that sounds interesting and sentimentally worth following. We're committing to an actual person and an actual event in real history, in real time, that's completely documentable. We're we're not people who are just making things up. That's the first thing that that, when you come to the resurrection, because let's face it, you don't see it often. Resurrection is not a normal occurrence. But hallelujah, it was normal for Jesus Christ. 
Now, what, what then, those are the testimony of the apostles. What about Jesus, his own testimony? What does he say about his resurrection? Well, in Revelation chapter 1, verse 9, he begins this way as John records this account. I, John, your brother and partner in the affliction, kingdom, and endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard a loud voice behind me like a trumpet saying, Write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Then I turned to see whose voice it was that spoke to me. When I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and among the lampstands was one like the Son of Man, dressed in a robe and with a golden sash wrapped around his chest. The hair of his head was white as wool, white as snow, and his eyes like a fiery flame. His feet were like fine bronze as it is fired in a furnace, and his voice like the sound of cascading waters. He had seven stars in his right hand, and a sharp double-edged sword came from his mouth, and his face was shining like the sun in his full strength. Now keep in mind, John the Apostle was intimately connected to Jesus, the guy who's writing this. He had spent three years with him the night of his betrayal at the Last Supper at the Passover meal. He had sat right next to Jesus. Now he sees Jesus in his fully unbridled state of glory in heaven. And notice his response, verse 17. When I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. He laid his right hand on me and said, Don't be afraid. I'm the first and the last and the living one. I was dead, but look, I'm alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. Who says that about themselves? I was dead, but now I'm alive forever and ever, and I have control over death. I rule death. Been there, done it, got the keys. Who says that about themselves? You see, Jesus is the only man who's ever lived that died and lived to tell about it. And he just didn't die and live to tell about it himself. He said it has implications for those of us who would trust him and follow him. Romans chapter 1, the apostle Paul is introducing himself in the Roman letter, and he says in verse 3, concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, who was a descendant of David according to the flesh, that means the Jewish Messiah King, and was appointed to be the powerful Son of God according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. You see, the resurrection confirmed that when Jesus said on Friday, it's finished, God the Father said on Sunday, amen, it's done. Let me tell you, in my own life, the thing that was most helpful for me, and I don't know why I didn't see this earlier, but I, you know, I'm slow, but I get there is it occurred to me and I realized one time with regarding to assurance of salvation and, and, and a relationship with Christ, the most important thing that God ever showed me was this reality, that I realized that when God forgave me, when I called on Jesus to be my Savior and God forgave me, He just didn't say, well, you know, Brad's a good guy, he means well, and... You know, we'll just kind of cut him some slack today. No, God didn't do that. God's holy and just. That's, that's, that's not his M.O. You see, the reason my sins are forgiven is because there was a judicial act 
of justice that took place when Jesus died on the cross. And my sin was judged the day Jesus died. And when I reach out and trust him, then that justice for my sin is satisfied and I'm free from the guilt and the punishment for that sin because Jesus has already taken it upon himself. And so God didn't forgive me because of sentimentality. God forgave me because of his justice and because justice had already been served. And when I cried out to Jesus, there was no double jeopardy. Can't be tried twice for the same crime because Jesus already satisfied it and I'm calling on him. And I tell you, that was liberating for me. It was absolutely liberating. And then, not only does Jesus' death satisfy the wrath of God for our sin and his resurrection proves that it was satisfied, but also... In John chapter 11, Jesus stood by the grave of his friend Lazarus, who'd been dead for four days. And the Bible says that Jesus looked at Lazarus' sister, and he said, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, even if he dies, will live. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. And then what did he do to prove he wasn't just blowing smoke? He called Lazarus up out of the grave. And then just a couple weeks later, he came out of his own grave. Jesus not only died and lived to tell about it, he promised if we trust him, he'll do the same for us. I, I, I'm, I'm mystified at why anybody wouldn't follow Jesus. Newsflash. If the Lord doesn't return for, first, you're going to be dead one day. I hate to break it to you. but you're not going to miss it. And whatever happens then lasts forever. And Jesus has promised that he will enable you to survive death with life. Why would anybody not follow Jesus? Just this past week, one of our... Uh, beloved members of our church passed away and we had a funeral last Monday and with a burial up in the land at the cemetery and I, I shared with the widow what I always share whenever we have a graveside committal service and you know I said uh, I, I said as we stood there by the grave I said did you buy this plot well yeah this was especially made a little awkward with the people from the cemetery standing there beside me. I said, did, did you buy this plot? Yes, I did. Well, I said, you got taken. Because he's not going to need it forever. You should have just rented it. Because Jesus said... He's going to empty this grave. Jesus is going to call him up out of here. And his resurrection proves that that's not hot air. That's real. You know, last thought this week, I got a, a text with a meme. Can you tell how groovy I am? Actually, the word is bougie. <laughs> Pastor Carly, did you hear me say that? Bougie. 
I don't even know what it means, but they always kid me about it, right? But I got a meme from a, a brother, a friend of mine, and 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 I we got it. We got to end with this. Sent me a picture. It says, "Darkness fell. His friend scattered. Death thought it had won, but heaven just started counting to three. Count to three.